the Quantum ES2 from Presonus. A quantum leap for the quantum series? Okay, I swear I'll keep the quantum jokes to a minimum in this video. Or do I? Hey, Julian Krauss here and Presonus has completely overhauled their quantum interface series and in this video we're going to have a look at the Quantum ES2 to see how it compares to similar offerings from SSL, Audient, Focusrite and more. Full disclosure, I have bought the interface with my own money, period. Let's jump right in. The ES2 has all controls on the top, which gives you ample space to use all the controls. Starting on the left, you get a phantom power button, which lets you toggle 48 volts for each of the two inputs individually. There's also an auto gain feature, which can help you set your gain to a proper value if you're not yet sure where to set it yourself. With the selection button, you can, well, select a channel and then the mute button mutes all the outputs. There are two more buttons, which lets you select the main rear outputs and the headphone outputs. And with the knob you can then control the aforementioned outputs, so gain setting and volume are all controlled with this one encoder. The nice part is that around the encoder you can always see the current setting and that makes it really easy to see what you're doing. There are only two connections on the front, one is a guitar input and the other one a headphone output in form of a quarter inch connection. On the rear you can find the remaining connections, two XLR and TRS combo inputs for mic and line level devices, two balanced TRS outputs to connect your studio monitors, and two USB-C connections. One to connect your interface to your PC, smartphone or iOS device and a second one in case the interface needs additional power. And it will let you know that it needs more power by angrily blinking at you. Sadly, one USB 2.0 connection is not enough and you will need to provide additional power to the interface via the second connection. Only with a direct USB-C connection the interface can be used with a single USB cable. Bit of an inconvenience here. I'm a bit surprised that the MIDI in and output have been implemented in the form of 3.5mm jacks. I thought the dedicated MIDI connector was more common, but I could be mistaken here. But this also means that you might need an additional breakout cable or adapter. And oh, what is that? An on-off switch? Holy! Okay, excuse my fake excitement here, but I really like to see an on-off switch on my interfaces as I might only use it from time to time and then it doesn't have to be on all the time and an on-off switch can be really handy. So, big thumbs up from me. And hopefully, big thumbs up from you also for the video. Hope you enjoyed it so far and if you like, you can also subscribe for more upcoming quantum jokes. Okay, let's have a look at the overall audio quality. The frequency response of the mic input is very flat and that means all frequencies are recorded equally which is obviously exactly what we want to see. Nice to see that this is also the case at the maximum gain setting because this is where some interfaces tend to struggle a bit. Here's how the response looks like with the high pass filter activated in the software, which has an 80 Hz roll off. I will get into that a little more later when we talk about the software. The distortion performance is okay, but you can definitely see a rise in distortion towards the maximum level. In practice, I would say this is not so dramatic because for the most part, when you set your gain, you leave yourself some headroom and typically you will be around minus 18 dBFS and then distortions don't even come into play. So while this could have definitely been designed better from a technical standpoint, I would argue that when you set your gain properly, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Dynamic range is another important spec to get low noise recordings, especially with condenser mics and line level signals. Here the ES2 comes in with 111.5 dBA. While there are definitely quite a few other interfaces that outperform the ES2 in terms of this spec, I'd say that this amount of dynamic range is already more than enough for the majority of cases and you can get really low noise recordings. That's great. Speaking of noise, the preamps are of course also important, especially when you use dynamic microphones. These mics have a low output signal and need a lot of amplification and this brings out the preamp noise. That's exactly why I pulled out one of the worst contenders in terms of sensitivity, the Shure SM7B. It has a notoriously low output signal and this is a worst case scenario for pretty much any preamp. Here's how the noise floor sounds like. Pretty clean if you ask me and this is backed up by my measurements. The ES2 comes in with an EIN of minus 129.4 dB UAE.
while the ES2 is not topping the chart with that, it is a very low noise and this means that there is really no need for an additional inline preamp like a cloud header. Especially because the ES2 has lots of gain, so you can amplify even the least sensitive microphones. Now before we continue, I want to bring up an issue that I was running into while testing, which has to do with, with RF interference. I found out that when I had the gain close to the maximum setting and a no-name power supply or my Class D amplifier, close to the microphone cable, then there is a chance that it could introduce some buzzing. I've done excessive tests, far more than is good for my sanity, but you have to imagine me running around my house holding the microphone cable directly onto all our sources that I could think of. And in the end, it was only the one power supply and my speaker amp that were causing issues. I have to add that the Class D amp spews out massive amounts of RF noise. It's really not a great design, so I'm not too surprised that this caused issues. I was a bit surprised though that pretty much all other interfaces that are tested the same way could withstand the RF bombardment from the amplifier without any audible interference. It's a bit hard for me to judge how big this issue really is because it only occurred with two of the dozens of RF producing devices I used to try to introduce interference. So while this issue only exists under very specific circumstances, and I would argue that under the majority of cases you never come across it, there is still some room for improvement here in terms of the RF shielding. Maybe something for the next generation. The next quantum leap, so to speak. The jokes are getting worse. Moving on, this is the line level input performance and I will keep it short as this is quite similar to the mic input. The frequency response is once again very flat, which is exactly what I like to see. Distortion performance is really great with all the distortion components easily below minus 100 dB which for all intents and purposes is inaudible. Dynamic range is even slightly better than for the mic inputs with around 114 dBA, which just barely misses the excellent category. All good here. Just one word of caution, I noticed that when turning the gain down further than 0 dB on the line inputs, this did not prevent the signal from clipping. So if your signal is already clipping with the gain at 0 dB, it will still clip if you turn the gain down further. Okay, jumping to the main output side. Here once again we can see a very flat frequency response, which is great to see. Distortion performance is alright, from a technical perspective one can achieve a slightly better performance today, but with all components below minus 80 dB there should be no case in which this becomes audible. So don't worry about it. The dynamic range is over 117 dB and that pretty much guarantees that you will never hear any noise from the ES2's main output. Nice. Headphone output specification overload time. This sheet shows you how the ES2 fares in multiple tests and how it compares to other interfaces. Let me just quickly highlight a few points here. It's nice to see that the ES2 has a good amount of power and I would say that it can drive most headphones to loud levels. Distortion performance is also good, not excellent, just good. And the same goes for noise performance. With over-ear headphones you should be fine and not hear any noise, but with sensitive IEMs there's a very good chance that you will hear a constant underlying hiss so IEMs are not really the best pairing with this interface. Because the volume is digitally controlled, the left and the right side stay equally loud at all volume settings, which is not always the case with other interfaces. The frequency response is once again nice and flat, although this does depend a bit on the headphones that you use. Sadly, the output impedance is relatively high with 20 ohms, and this means that under some circumstances, this can negatively impact the sound. To counteract this, I would generally recommend to use higher impedance headphones like 80 ohms and above, as this minimizes this issue. Here I would have definitely liked to see a lower output impedance from the ES2. All right, let's have a quick look at the software features and I wanna mention that while testing, I already saw multiple firmware updates which have fixed a couple of bugs. So it's nice to see that Presonus seems to be actively working on improving their products. Although I found this message particularly amusing, not sure how Presonus' firmware numbering scheme works, but apparently it's a countdown. Maybe that's a quantum mechanic I can't comprehend. Okay, jokes aside, they already fixed that in the latest Universal Control version, but I thought it was funny. When you open Universal Control, you can see all your connected devices. In my case, the ES2. You can set things like the sample rate and buffer size here. I think my biggest gripe with the software is that you have to create an account to get continuous updates for Universal Control. 
I just don't understand why so many manufacturers are forcing you to create an account these days. When you click on the device, another panel opens up and this gives you all kinds of controls. First of all, you can set the high pass filter on your inputs, which can be quite handy. As mentioned, this is a fixed 80 Hz filter. To also mention here, this is a digital filter and it does not prevent clipping when the input is already overdriven. Not that this is an issue in most cases, but just something to be aware of. You can also toggle the 48 volt phantom power for each input individually and have the option to select auto gain. This listens to a short segment and then sets the gain to a decent recording level. In my tests this worked quite well and this can give you a quick starting point, especially if you're new to recording. Further down you can see some monitoring controls. You can mono or solo an input, pan the input, link them to a stereo recording and adjust their level. On the right side you can control the main out and headphone volume and have a few more controls for the main mix. In the settings menu you get a few more options to customize your experience. Here you can control the LED's brightness, dim amount, level meter settings and a couple of other general settings. All in all really nice to see that you can control so many features of the ES2 in software in case you don't want to reach for the interface. Now I can't leave you without some latency measurements. Roundtrip latency is the time it takes for a signal to be plied back and then recorded again. This is important for example when you monitor your audio with effects on them in real time, like an AmSim. Here I have good news, the RTLs are on the quicker side compared to other interfaces, especially when you use higher sample rates. That's a good showing. And I quickly want to mention that for direct monitoring the signal runs through an AD and DA conversion, but this adds less than a millisecond of delay and in practice this is very much imperceptible. Let's close this out with some pros and cons. On the plus side I see the usability of the ES2. With its wedge shape and the controls at the top it's super easy to access all the buttons and knobs. In addition to that if you prefer to change your settings like input gain and volume via software you absolutely can as pretty much all functions are also software controlled. Generally speaking the audio quality is quite good, the preamps are low noise and the interface provides plenty of dynamic range with a good to great distortion performance. I also like the additional software features like high pass filter and the auto gain function. On the flip side the headphone output impedance is a bit too high for my liking and for accurate sound reproduction you should stick to headphones with 80 ohms or higher. The RF immunity seems to be slightly lower compared to competing interfaces and it seems you have to create an account to get constant updates which I find quite annoying. Lastly, a single USB 2.0 connection is not sufficient to power the interface and you need to use a second USB connection for power. Not the end of the world, but similar interfaces manage to work just fine with one USB 2 connection. If you want to just use one cable for data and power with the ES2, you will have to use a USB-C connection on your laptop or PC. All in all, I think the Quantum ES2 is a decent interface, but I wouldn't really say it's a quantum leap, more of a quantum hop. The performance of the ES2 is not pushing any boundaries, but it is good in most cases where it counts. And performance wise it slots in nicely between competing interfaces. Alright, please leave a like, subscribe for more and I will see you all in the next one.